What's up, people? GNR TV, streaming done right. It has all the channels that you would want. You know, the regular channels, channels from out of state, pay-per-views, sports, the movie channels, porn. It has over 2,000 channels in general. Over 2,000 channels. $20 a month for two devices now. Not one, but two devices for 20 bucks, and you get all that amazing stuff. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, there's no sports right now. There's not really many pay-per-views. Well, guess what? There is sports because UFC is back. And there's pay-per-views because guess what? UFC is back, and the rest of the sports will be back eventually, and it's worth it. This app is freaking amazing. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I've had it for a little over a year now. I'm never going to get rid of it, and I love it. I love it so much. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, you need to get it. And enjoy the rest of the show. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? I got the awesome Rebecca Reinhardt on here. Rebecca, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm happy to have you on here like we were just talking about. And we were talking about someone who you were actually, this is one of your co-stars, Monkey Vader. Yep. Awesome yep. ball of energy. Jihan. <laughs> Johnny Shandor, yeah. So we were just talking about her because she was on your show before. She's actually, she's in my film and she's kind of, um, I, she kind of idolizes me <laughs> and it feels weird. Like I feel like I have a responsibility because she looks up to me as far as horror and acting and movies and that type of thing. But she is, she is definitely a she is a force to be reckoned with, and she is definitely somebody that everybody needs to be on the lookout for. She uh, is going to be big. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And I, you saying that she looks up to you, she really does, because she's mentioned you on my show a couple times, and then she's even mentioned you, like, before and after the interview. Like, she's just <laughs> – which, I, it's cool, though. It's cool that, you know, and that not only did she get to – she gets to meet you. I'm sure she gets to talk to you when she – needs to or wants to and that probably feels really really good to her so it's awesome you're doing that for her now she's gonna be in a yeah. movie with you so that probably just made her yeah he has to be the coolest kid in school come on now like i that's something yeah. i would brag about. Like, look i'm gonna be in a horror movie guys yeah Simply. i mean she's definitely the coolest kid in my book and actually i met her so i told you i'd tell you the story of how i met her mm -hmm. i I always say like, my friend Johnny or whatever, and it feels weird because she's eight. But I mean, I actually like met. I was I knew her before I knew her parents. Um, but we were at a convention, uh, Days of the Dead in Indianapolis, and we were in line. My friend Shannon and I were in line for a photo op with Felissa Rose and Catherine Cammy from Sleepaway Camp. And in walks this little eight-year-old girl in a Camp Arawak shirt, and she's all ready for her photo op. And Felissa runs out there, like just goes crazy, and is just like, "Oh my God, you're so adorable!" Whatever. And then she ends up in line next to me. And so I'm like, hey, you, might, you must like horror, right? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, so what's your favorite horror movie? She's like, oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> but I do, but I'll tell you, I am, I've got to lay off Indonesian doll films for a while because those are really starting to freak me out. <laughs> Like, you're cool. And then later that night, she shows up to, uh, to karaoke and sings uh, Rock and Roll All Night from Kiss. Very first person up on stage. And I was like, you are awesome. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Yeah, and I actually didn't even know, like, I didn't know her past that. Like, I, had, I put a video up of some of that stuff. And mm -hmm. I was like, if anybody knows this girl or knows her parents or whatever, like, please, like, you know, tag them or whatever. And then finally... Her mom, Marcella, I don't know how she, how she found it or who told her or whatever, but like finally, like she tagged me on Instagram. It's like, I'm Johnny's mom. <laughs> so, cool. and she's also in my film as well. That's really, that's really cool. And I talked to them. I talked to her husband a little bit too, which I'm going to have mm -hmm. him on my show one of these days. It's cool that like the whole family's really into horror. And I just, again, I think it's awesome and healthy. And it's cool because it's like, you have a kid and they're growing up doing what you're doing. I mean, as far as just being a fan of that genre, because now kids are like, oh, my parents like that. Oh, that's stupid. I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. That's corny. Yeah. But with her, it's the complete opposite. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's like the, that's like the total strike on something now. So, but not for her. No. Not, 
not at all. <laughs> not at all. Which, again, I, it just amazes me. Like we were talking about a few minutes ago, how somebody that age has the knowledge she has with horror and that she's into it at that age because you really don't see it. Since our generations, when we were kids, you would see it a lot more. And yeah. I feel, like, I feel like it was more frowned upon when we were kids in a sense of like horror being the quote unquote outcasts. Right. Well, when we were kids, too, it was also, like, it was taboo, you know? It was all, like, oh, my God, like, I heard this is, like, the scariest thing ever, you know? There's, like, a little, oh, it's contests and stuff, and now we just don't have that. Yes. <clears throat> One thing I do miss, besides going to the video store, which was such a great thing, I do kind mm -hmm. of miss the VHS look, which I wish Blu-rays and DVDs would give you the option to watch the VHS look or the regular look, only because for certain movies... Yeah especially like slashers like or like, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you get like that more dark, yeah. gritty look. But I say Blu-ray DVD having that because then, you know, how ha you know what happens when you watch a tape a thousand times. It's eventually done. Uh -huh. It's eventually done. The VCR chews it up. Yeah. So, yeah, I have, I have a, a thought on this. Um, so, first of all, and this, like, I think you and I are on the same boat on this, that don't just throw a filter on it either because that's mm -hmm. just, like, the worst. Like, I mean, I'm not saying, like, you know, newer movies that put a filter on are not bad. But, like, yeah, going back to, like, the original print and just – just digitally transferring it without yeah. doing any kind of a restoration or whatever. And Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a good one um, because I, like I have an ultra 4k TV. I've got, you know, ultra 4k Blu-ray player, blah, blah, blah. And not that long ago, maybe three or four months ago, I popped in Texas Chainsaw Massacre and there was, you know, the one like famous shot of Pam like coming into like walking across the yard and it goes and you know the camera goes under the swing and just follows her you know and it's just this like cool awesome one long shot it's what everybody talks about and I was like that looks so good like the like the trees were like all like perfect you know and everything was crystal clear and I'm like I don't like it I don't because it's part of what made that movie scary is that it did look low quality and almost like a snuff film and that's part of the reason why i still like it exactly and so yeah there are some things that just they they need that so that's why i say both i say both options because you got again you got the one beautiful option where it looks great then you got the gritty option yeah i say both options just in case because there's times you're like you know what i have this 4k tv or whatever I want to see what this thing can right. do. So you get to watch it like that. And then the dark. Right. You, you want to see the toothpicks coming out of Mrs. Voorhees' neck when she gets decapitated sometimes. <laughs> sometimes you do. But then, you, always, then you, you get that feeling back, I guess that childhood feeling when you're watching it, when it's nice and dark and gritty. It's like, this is just, this is perfect. Kids might not understand. Why are you watching? This looks terrible. No, this is, this is how it's supposed to look. This is great. Yeah. It's I'm, actually, I'm actually a fan of the dead format uh, Selectivision. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It was very brief, probably six, seven years. It's an RCA thing. It's, it was a precursor to laser discs. Okay. But uh, they are, they're, they're the size of albums and they're plastic caddies. You may have seen some like at flea markets or like cons and stuff. Sometimes people sell them because mm -hmm. they've got like the cool artwork on them and people hang them on their walls. Mm -hmm. I have a player and I will watch them that. It's a record inside. It's a movie on a record. It's oh. on front and back. Yeah. So, yeah, but, you, but even seeing that, like watching, like for, I'll go back to Friday the 13th because, you know, I'm a Friday the 13th girl. Me too. Well, not but, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the original one, when you watch it, like as, with every, um, with every new transfer, there are certain things that just look worse and worse and worse. First, mm -hmm. Annie's neck, like her neck appliance is like completely different than her face color it takes you out of it and then also kevin bacon's neck appliance is like mm -hmm. a completely different color but if you go back and you watch that the way it was meant to be like if you watch it on vcr you watch it on ced that it looks good yeah. you know i mean and so and, and these people who are doing this watching dailies in 1979 1980 they weren't going well, now that looks good now, but what's it going to look like, you know, in 2020 when we have like advanced technology? I mean, you know, like it would, it, like you have to go back to kind of see what it would have looked like to mm -hmm. somebody who saw that in the theater, like opening day. That is one thing I always say to people. Like, I, I wish I had a time machine, but being the age that I am now, the mindset I am now, to go back 
when certain horror movies came out and just watch them in theaters while those people are seeing them for the first time to see how their reactions were. Mm -hmm. Like like The Exorcist, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween, the Friday the 13th, just like when those movies first came out because there was nothing like that before then. Like now we're kind of numb to it. We've seen all the movies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and like it, there, every once in a while, a movie will come out, and you feel like, okay, maybe this is it. Like the one that I thought for sure, and this is not recent. <laughs> this is, I guess, modern. Let's put it this way: me okay. as an adult. The one that I was like, okay, this is going to be the game changer. This is going to be the movie that I'm going to talk about. Like that, I went to see on opening night, and it changed my freaking life. Was House of a Thousand Corpses. Like, I, when I first heard Rob Zombie was doing a horror movie, I'm like, yes, please. Like, everything was just very flat, very, like, very, I know what you did last summer kind of thing. And I was like, this is going to be great. And I went to see it, and I liked it. But it didn't, it was not life-changing. Now, however, 17 years later, I'm telling the story about how I went to go see that on opening night. So, <laughs> I might have to retract a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now it's, I love it. It's, like, one of my favorite movies. But, um, but yeah, like it just wasn't like it was, I'm like, it, that's just not the same as going to see the exorcist, like for the first, yeah. you know, on the opening weekend and not knowing anything about it. That see that that's, that's what I mean. I would love to be able to get that mm-hmm. from it. Like I, I got to see, um, what was it a couple of years ago, my wife and I got to see nightmare on Elm street in theaters, which was oh. the original, which was amazing. They're having some special, mm-hmm. I think regal cinemas were doing it all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I did see that. And we almost didn't go because it was a snowstorm. But I was like, no, we're, I was like, we, we got to go to this. <laughs> we are going to, we're going to risk our lives, honey. Get in the car. <laughs> it was more her too. She was like, we're still going. And she's a big, like, I'm a more of a Jason fan. She's more of a Freddie fan anyway. And seeing that on the big screen was, I was just like, wow, this is, this is so cool. I, just, I wish I could have seen this back when it came out originally. But yep. I, I also have the, I wish I could men in black my, mind sometimes oh, yeah. like there are certain movies like sleepaway camp like i watch sleepaway like i rented sleepaway camp to like back in the day i rented it so many times i could have bought the vhs for how many times i rented it and that says a lot because yep. <laughs> those boogers were expensive but i rented that probably like 20 times before i ever watched the first one so I had like, it, I was already like, yeah, Angela, chick, you know, she's a chick now, but whatever. She, I, I know she was a boy. And I mean, I heard the story 15 times, but I didn't like, I couldn't get that shock value back. And it's like, I just kind of sometimes wish I could just wipe my memory and be like, I just want to watch this first one. Like Friday the 13th, again, going back to that. That's a whodunit. Yeah. And I try to go back and think about like, okay, which, what parts of these are red herrings? You know, like what, te- what are the little breadcrumbs they were trying to put in there? Because you're so immune to it now. You don't really see any of like the storytelling that they originally did. That's very true. And speaking of Friday the 13th, that's one story <clears throat> that if, rather it be a fan made film or just rewatching the originals. That's one story I never get tired of when they're sitting by the campfire talking about the quote unquote mm-hmm. Jason and they find out he's real. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Excuse me. It's such a simple story, but it's so well done that I can listen yeah. to it a thousand different times in a thousand different ways mm-hmm. and just be almost as excited as I was the first time I heard it. Yeah. That's one thing I love about that. Like I, I love the replay value about that movie and a lot of the other eighties movies. And I, that's one thing that I feel like we're kind of missing right now with horror as far as yeah. the, big, the big Hollywood ones. There's a few that might do something, but for the most part, it's like yeah. you watch them once or twice and that's it. Yeah, you know, like last year, um, you know, I did my, I did, you know, my best of 2019 or whatever, you know, and I was kind of like, I was trying to like, look at them. Oh, I know what it was. I was doing, um, I, it was, we were supposed to, <laughs> it was for the Exploding Heads podcast. Um, they were compiling, like a bunch of us podcast people were compiling our top 100 of the decade. So 2000 to 2019. And we had to like order them and stuff. And when I got to like, you know, the top ones, you know, cause then it's like, you know, Sophie's choice, like, Oh, is it this one or that one? Mm-hmm. But I was like, I started choosing on like rewatchability. I'm like, yeah, I, I really loved hereditary, but you know what? I've watched it twice and I can probably do without watching it ever again. Mm-hmm. Cabin in the woods. I can pop that thing on any time and recite the whole damn thing. And I love it. You know, that's going to go higher for me. Um, there is like, there is just, 
there is a lack of re of rewatchability and some of it does have to do with just because of like the big twist of whatever movie you know whatever particular movie everybody's trying to be like a little different um and try to do something that just is going to lose its luster after a couple times of seeing it i like that you said that because <clears throat> for me i watch like the movies i'll still give you two examples like the thing and jaws I feel like mm -hmm. those movies are damn near perfect, but going yeah. back to Friday the 13th again, I'm way more inter Like, I can watch those movies every day and not get tired of them. Not that I would get sick of Jaws. Yeah. But that's, like, one of those movies you watch maybe once every, say, once every few months or once every right. few years, and then that's it. The other ones, they're not as good with the storytelling and all that, of course, but they're just more fun to watch. Like, who doesn't want to pop in a Friday the 13th? I have a comfort. I have this comfort with, like, camp slasher movies i'm the same way and like i i mean like i always i call it comfort movies and um especially since like we've been in this situation that we're in mm -hmm. uh and like um i know that i i'm not the only one who's been kind of like looking towards comfort type things so either whether it be booze or food or you know movies or whatever but i've been finding myself like re-watching a lot of things that i've seen a million times i've been just watched the brady bunch like start to finish like twice okay <laughs> but like those are the ones that like i'll put on and i i don't need to watch it like i know like the burning i put that on and i don't have to pay attention i can clean my house or whatever but just that sound in the background of it there's something very like soothing to me i don't know if it's nostalgia or what it is or I, i'm not sure there's something about that 80s slasher especially those those camp yes you know kiss, killing your teenagers it's, I, I, I'm the same way. Like I can, for example, there's times where I'll be editing and I'll have a movie playing in the background just, just for background noise. It's usually a movie I've seen before right. that I enjoy. And I'm just like, okay. And I do not have to look at the screen. I already know you just buy this. Okay. I know. Yeah. Yep. You laugh before they make the joke, you know, you, whatever you are, you go, Ooh, before they get killed. Yeah. <laughs> Jason's about to throw somebody through a window. How do you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But yeah, I, it's, I don't know what it is about it either. It could be the comfort with it. It could be the nostalgia of it and seeing it since, you know, childhood and all that good stuff. And they're just entertaining movies at the end of the day. Yeah. Like they did, they have the practical effects and I feel like they did what they're supposed to. Like I feel now, not all, but I feel with some movies, they're trying way too hard to entertain us. And then I feel some aren't doing enough, which may seem right. quite... And then some yeah. are just doing the same thing over. As far as remakes go, I'm a person who does enjoy remakes. Do not get me wrong. But they have to be done right. I know people say you can always, like, because I say the remakes, I'll watch them. I love horror, so I'll watch it. And you can always go back to the original if you hate the remake. But I just feel like if you do a remake, especially like a big classic remake, you have, you have to do it justice. You have to do it right. You, you yeah. have to. There, and there are a few. I mean, like uh, Dawn of the Dead remake. I like that better than Dawn of the Dead. You know, the crazies, same thing. I like the remake better, you know, but there are certain movies that I just, the remakes, I'm like, they just don't have the same yeah. oomph. I'll throw another one in there. Evil Dead. I like that remake better than the original. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which really, it's not a, it's not a remake so much as a sequel. If really? you like, if you, yeah, if you read up on it, because clearly there, there's a lot of reference to Ash and his friends were in that cabin. Okay. So... Yeah, so it's really kind of a sequel. I wish they'd make another one. I haven't seen that movie in, in a while. I think since it I came out, either. watched it in theaters. But um, yeah, that I thought that was That's done. Good. Well. And then Texas Chainsaw Massacre from '03. I don't like it better than the original, but they did an excellent job with it. I feel. I do like, and especially I have this, I have this thing about um two good looking of people in horror movies. Like if they're like two like like put together and like just like generically good looking and whatever i don't like i don't get scared at movies anyway but like i definitely don't have a sense of fear for the, for those characters when it's like but really despite like the spray tan and the you know fake sweat and everything jessica beale like really did a good job like i was really kind of terrified for her maybe it's because she was mary camden before she did great. <laughs> great but i i do agree with you when they put too many pretty people in the movie you you can yeah. kind of tell like okay this person's way too pretty they're not gonna die and it pisses me off i don't like when they put big names in horror movies unless they were with the genre for like most of their career 
And I don't like when they put yeah. two. I'm just like, come on now. This is this isn't how this is gonna go down. No, no. this guy's way too pretty. He's gonna run just like I would. <laughs> He's like, yeah, right? yeah, like yeah. That's the thing too. You just can't. You're like, she's not gonna put up a fight. She's gonna break a nail. You know, like you just you your brain. It's not even like a thing that you're thinking. It's like your brain is just like triggering those thoughts. Like this I can't. This is not scary at all. This is I cannot feel for this character at all. <laughs> you know what it is too. I feel like if you put. I'm not gonna say ugly people, but um, like an average-looking person for me, you can relate more to the characters than if mm-hmm. it's just, like putting a bunch of supermodels in a movie. I'm like, okay, this isn't really. And that's and that's one of the things that I love about independent horror. It's one of the things that's drawn me to this genre as both a fan and a filmmaker and an actress, is that I like that idea of like people that look like you, <laughs> you know, people that are just like normal, like they pick them off the streets. And, and that's really how it usually goes with indie horror is it's just normal people doing their own makeup, doing their own hair and, you know, wearing the clothes that they, you know, that mm-hmm. they walked in on, no costumes or anything like that. It's just, you know, it's very natural. And you actually like feel a little bit more connection with those people and you feel like they could really be in peril. Indie horror is something I, I love. I support it as much as I can when the indie go is going, if I have the money, I'll I always try to get, at least get the Blu-ray just because I'm like, when this comes out, I need to own it. But it's just my brother. I'll take these words from my brother. He's saying it's like the backbone of horror. And that's because you guys come up with like fresh ideas. And then if you do do like, you know, like a fan film, like a Friday the 13th, not only do you switch it up some, but you make these movies for the fans. It's for the fans by fans, whether it's your own idea or a fan film versus the big Hollywood movies. It's more of like, let me just make a bunch of money off this movie. Let me do a remake because I know these guys are going to co-see it, which we do. Or, let me, you know, let me do this movie. And that's fine. Movie. It's not an either or. It's, Most people think you have to pick a side and you don't. Oh, no. No, <laughs> I, I, I enjoy both. But I'm just saying, like, I have, I guess I have more of a passion and more of a respect for the indie horror. Because, again, it's mm-hmm. like someone like me can pick up a camera. I mean, I'd have to have more talent. But someone like me can pick up a camera or write a script or something and just go do it and have fun with it. And I feel... It's good for the younger generation, too, especially with all this technology. Hey, I want to make movies. Go grab your phone and just do something with your friends. Write up a little script and do something with your friends and just keep practicing at it. And you might not you might not be good at it. You might be great at it. You never know until you try it. But you actually have access to do it now. Yeah. And a lot of us didn't when we were younger. Like, I mean, not at all. I mean, like there are very few people. I mean, there are a few people that I actually really look up to Mm. now who are, uh, people who directed movies, who made movies that I rented when I was a kid mm. and uh, at video stores. And I didn't realize until much, much later that they weren't that much older than I was. Uh, so Tim Ritter is definitely one who has become kind of my mentor. Um, but yeah, I'm just like, I didn't know when I rented Truth or Dare when I was like 14, that like this was like made by like a 17 year old. Like, had I known that, maybe would my life have gone a little differently? You know, like, yeah. you know? But again- Rolf Konevsky made a, There's Nothing Out There. And I loved that movie. I was a video store. I worked at a video store when that came out. And I loved that movie in 92. And then it was like, it was only like two or three years ago that I found out he was, he's like two years older than I am. And that like devastated me. I'm like, had I known that, maybe, just maybe, I would have done something different, you know? Every, I guess everything does happen for a reason. And I'll say, going back to that too, as far as getting the equipment to record a movie and all that was way more expensive than it is now. Because yeah. now, again, you can literally use your cell phone at least for- Right, yeah. I mean, we all have a great, yep. you know, a great camera. I mean- Start out with that and then, you know, work your way up. But <clears throat> I, I just love it. I love how when you guys- put out these awesome indie films and I love seeing the horror community work together. I hate when you see like, there's, there's a few people who you just bump heads with or whatever the case may be. I don't mind so much the bumping heads. I don't like when people tear each other down or like say, say for example, say me and you had a falling out and say, I'm just saying you were hundred percent wrong, but say we had a falling out. You didn't publicize it. And Mm -hmm. I did. I look like the asshole, no matter what happens. I hate when people do that. I'm like, if you have a falling out, you're adult. Leave it at that. Just we don't talk, whatever. Leave it. Leave it. It's, well, and this, this brings up a good point of, um, and this is a problem when you're making um, independent films. We don't make <laughs> a 
crap off of these movies. I mean, like maybe like if you're acting in it, maybe you get paid a little bit of money. Uh, if you direct a movie that does decently, maybe you're maybe you get a distribution deal and get a little bit of money off of it. But most of the time, you're just working to get enough money to be able to do your next project. Yeah. And no, there are some people who don't care because they're not getting paid that much or because it's almost like, oh, I'm just doing this for a friend. Um, there's that lack of uh, like urgency. Mm. Like, you know, like I can just, oh, I can just bail because it's just my friend. She doesn't care, you know. And there's a lot of that that goes on in indie horror. Um, you have to like, I mean, the, my, my thing is I always say nobody's going to care about your project, even a fraction of what you care about your project. You can't assume that anybody else is going to be on board 100% and like going to be there the whole time um, because of that. And it's, it's understandable too, you know, because everybody, this is so secondary for everybody. Everybody has jobs, everybody has families. Um, and this is not for fame and fortune. This is not like to propel anybody to, you know, like, oh, I'm going to get noticed like Blumhouse, you know, <laughs> like, um, this is really just more for like the love of it. And so, yeah, there, are, you can run into some people who are just unreliable and there, there's been criticism I've heard of like, um, within our genre, our scene or whatever, of like certain, like people getting cast in too many things. Like I'm sick of seeing so-and-so and everything. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that so-and-so has proven him or herself exactly. that they, even though they're, yeah, even though they are working for peanuts, they show up and they work, they're reliable and that's why they get cast. I mean, yeah. like, I mean, not saying that, you know, I mean, talent is there too, but it's like, it's definitely like everybody kind of starts gravitating towards like th their own little group that they know that they can trust and count on because you kind of have to. Well, yeah, I agree with that. And I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense because, again, I see people, you know, OK, I'm not going to get paid for this. So I'm not going to put my all into it. And I look at it like if you're going to try something like that, as far as a movie goes, mm -hmm. do your best. Enjoy it. Do your best. Yeah. Ups and downs with it. And whatever, you know, whatever happens, happens with it. But just you're doing it. For, you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the fans. You're doing it for the horror genre. Yeah, you're <laughs> And yeah, and you're doing it, you're, it's supposed to be enjoyable, and you're supposed to be, yeah, it's, it's a joint effort, and it's fun, you know? I mean, that's, that's what it all comes down to, I guess, if it comes to a point where it's not fun anymore, then you probably well, yeah. don't do it anymore. If you don't enjoy it, and then as far as the money part goes, I mean, if you're doing it for the money, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Right? No, if you're doing it for the money, then you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> for the wrong reasons, because as you said, there's no money, there's little to no money into it, and you could yeah. say the same with what I do with the podcasting, there's yeah, pretty much no money into it unless you get advertisements and all that, which can happen. Mm -hmm. You grab them here and there, but if you're doing it for that reason, which I've, excuse me, I was on a podcast panel a couple times. I remember somebody asked us when we were up on the panel, like, "So, do you make money off the podcast?" I was like, "No." Yeah. But I said, and then they're just yeah, and then they just are like, "What? Why do you do it?" And I I told him I was like, I said, "Listen, I said if you want to start a podcast, start one. Yes, I said, but if you're going into it to make money." I said, you won't last 10 episodes before you burn yourself out and you lose passion mm -hmm. for it. I said, if you're doing it just as a hobby and having fun, you're going to last a long, not only are you going to last, but you never know what can happen later on down the road, but you can't mm -hmm. always, I think it's bad when people look at every opportunity is how much can I make off of this? Cause then yes. you don't put your all into it. You can yeah. just put your all into it. If something happens to where, Hey, you luck out, you're one of the people that luck out and like, Hey, I made a lot of money off of this. Cool. Off my passion. Cool. But if you're someone who's just doing it as a passion and that's just what it is. And yep. there's nothing wrong with that either. Yep. I, I, I like to say I make enough on my podcast Patreon to pay for my podcast hosting. And I'm good with that. Every once in a while, maybe I have like two extra dollars. I can get a coffee that month. You know? <laughs> hey, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, with the podcasting, what I, what I do enjoy about it, I mean, everything. But one thing that I think is cool is like when I go to cons, like there's one called ScareCon. I get, I get a media pass. So I get in there for free. Yeah. I get a free table. I just have to pay for power for the weekend, but I bring my whole set up there. I get a table and I think that's an awesome thing right there. And you get, yeah. some, you get, it opens up some doors as far as opportunities for interviews. I get to interview so many people around the world. I get to talk to cool people like yourself and I just take it for what it, I mean, I, I love yeah. that. About it. I love yeah, that. I, 
Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's been one of my huge passions that I, I mean, cause that's how I started. I mean, I, I started as a, as a promoter, a podcaster, a YouTuber, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, started interviewing filmmakers. That's how I got into it because then I kind of started talking to all these filmmakers and realizing, Hey, I could do it myself. And, and also just with the acting part of it, it was like, I started, you know, getting, closer to some directors and then they're like oh hey here just you're gonna be in my movie you know and then like director a here's the like director b used you and then director b's like well i need to put you in my movie too if he used you you know yep. and so it just kind of like yeah spirals down but yeah it's it's just awesome to be able to like talk to people and um be a part of it be supportive and, and that's something that a lot of people probably don't realize um is that we do have like contact with people. So mm-hmm. I was amazed, I think the first time that I, I watched a movie on like Amazon Prime, like a, an independent movie or something. And, and I was like, I really like this movie. And like, I get on Instagram or Facebook and I look up the director and send a message. And like, as I'm watching the movie, I get a message back from that director. And it's like, what? Like, you don't realize that like, there's a certain level of like, you know, like people always think it's like if somebody makes a movie, they're untouchable. Mm -hmm. But then you start realizing, no, there's this whole like layer of people who are like, let's talk about my stuff. Yeah. You know, and it's really cool. Yeah. I I agree with you 1 million percent. Like I'm the type of, I reach out, like how I reach out to you. I do the same thing, pretty much send the same, I guess you can say same generic message, but I'm just like, Hey, I'm a huge horror fan. I'd love you on my show or at least check it out. You get yeses, you get noes. And I'm the type of person I don't get, I don't get scared if some if I feel somebody's gonna say no. If they say no, so what? I don't get yeah. offended if somebody says no. And I'm just and I also keep it in my mind, like say you know, say if I reach out to somebody that's Hollywood or whatever the case may be, and they say no because in the back of their mind maybe my show is not big enough, and then say later on it grows more. I'll remember that. It's not that I wouldn't let them on, but all those people that said yes, the door's exactly. always open for them. Mm-hmm. I'm not like I again the no's I would say yes to, but say if you want to come on again and say somebody that told me no, let's just say today's wanting to come on at some point you're coming on first because you had no issue just coming on here and because i'm here exactly and I, <laughs> like i said i don't get offended by it. i understand it for maybe from their standpoint of hey you know i want to be on a bigger show so i can get a bigger promotion for myself whatever the case may be and then it feels cool to work with indie artists because i love talking to people and seeing how far they've grown over the years and one of these indie artists yeah. you, we might be watching them on you know on in Hollywood one day. And it's like, cool. I had them on my podcast a few years ago. I have. Yeah. Well, and there's also a sense of like, uh, there's a sense of uh, self-satisfaction too. I don't know if you've had this yourself, but it's like, I've promoted like certain movies that kind of were on the very, like, you know, they were like struggling and I found them and I love them and I started promoting them and doing things for them and like became really good friends with the filmmakers and, and like, and they've helped me out because I helped them out. And like, like I can say, like, I honestly like made a difference, mm-hmm. you know, like whether it was, I just pulled in, you know, 20 new people to watch that movie. That's huge for some movies. Oh yeah. That's so, huge. I mean, yeah. So it's like when you feel like you can actually make a contribution and get somebody's art out there and get other people to appreciate it. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. I agree. I've, I've actually had people, reach out to me from either hearing my show or being referred from somebody who was on my shows, especially with the indie scene. Like he really does have a passion for the indie scene. He promotes it as much as he can, does this, that, and the third. And they'll just reach out. Hey, can I come on here? I'm just like, of course. Yeah, of course. Come on my show. I'd love that. And that, that feels so good. Cause again, I'm just doing this as like, just, I just enjoy horror so much. I love talking to people reviewing movies and all that good stuff. So I'm just like, you know, I'm doing it as that. And then when somebody reaches out to you for something like that, it feels great. I'm like, Oh wow. I'm actually mm-hmm. making a difference. Yeah. And, and it, it just, I'm not going to say it makes me want to do it more because I want to do it, but at the same time, it puts a little bit more of a drive in me. Like yesterday. Right. Like you feel like it's, it, like when you feel like something's all for naught, you're like, well, why am I doing this? But yeah, when you feel like, okay, there's actually like I'm making a contribution and I, you have some kind of almost like proof. Yeah. Yeah. It makes you want to do it more. Like yes, yesterday I did an interview, right? Right after my interview, the lady's agent hi- or hired me. The lady's agent emailed me and was like, I heard you do movie reviews. I would love for you to review my movie. I'll send you a screener. Perfect. Yeah. I, 
I just I was like, is it cool if I, you know, send it to one of my co-hosts too, just so I can review it? Because when I review movies, I do it with other people. Right. And I was like, yeah, of course. So stuff yeah. like stuff like that means so much, and it's so awesome. Yeah, it's all about the free stuff. We get free stuff. We do at times. Yeah. And I mean, maybe not get money, but we can get some cool stuff sometimes. I mean, and the screener is amazing. Like I never, <coughs> never thought I'd get something like. I'm just like I know. I get to I get to watch a movie that a lot of people don't get to see yet until you know whenever it comes yeah. out. Yeah. That feels great. Yeah, that's always an awesome feeling. Yeah, like, ooh, like you, like you're like privy to something. You know, the first time that I ever got a screener, like from I don't know how I ended up on like some of the um like the mass lists of like the different uh, studios, but like the first time I ever got one that was like totally unsolicited. Like if I would, if I liked a movie and or whatever, if I wanted to see a movie and I contacted the director, sometimes they'd give you like a screener or whatever. Yeah. But like when it was like, I was like part of like their press list, you know, <laughs> that just got sent out. All if that. you're interested in this new movie, then please da, da, da. I was like, oh, wow, I feel legit. <laughs> that's, that's, that's so cool right there. That's so cool. Yeah, it's awesome. But it, it, it just makes, it does make you want to do a little bit more and again, it's it's so freaking fun. Like talking again, talking to people around the world. I talked to a guy from Australia a couple of weeks ago. That was cool. And who would have thought? I'm just sitting in my home on my computer, mm -hmm. talking random horror with some you know across the world. Yep, the power of technology. Oh yes, good. It's good and bad. <laughs> yeah, but it but in this case, it is great. Oh, yeah. it's freaking, especially now with this whole pandemic. It's it's awesome. Like, I think. I think I did about 35 episodes. I think this is like my 35th or 36th episode since we've been quarantined. Mm -hmm. Recording and editing when I can and recording, yeah. editing, watching movies. It gets repetitive and it, it almost clumps in, not in a bad way, it almost clumps in the one because I do so many to where I'm like, okay, I did this episode, but when did I do this? When did I do that? What movie did I, re I just forget. It yeah. Like but I'm enjoying like every second of it. Yeah. Same here. <clears throat> So, oh, okay, this. <laughs> I'm, I'm still getting used to this. Just do this. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys are supposed to be recording. <clears throat> um, was it around this time or was it later towards the summer? Uh, so, okay, so he's talking about The Embalmers, um, which is my film that I am I'm writing, producing, and directing with my sister, uh, Diane Frager. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm like, my allergies are really bad today. Uh, and we're also co-writing with uh, one of our stars, Rob Mello. Um, we are doing our Indiegogo right now. We're at the tail end of our Indiegogo. We started it, I think, March 13th. Um, and we were poised to be doing pretty well. And we did really well for like two or three days. I mean, we were like really kicking butt. And then like that's when things started shutting down. So of course, like my sister said, she's like, leave it to us to start an Indiegogo campaign when then there's a pandemic. <laughs> like, sure, why not, you know? But we powered through. So we, before that, we actually got uh, quite a few of our cast together and we shot a teaser. This is essentially like the first five, six, seven minutes of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and so we shot that because we wanted to have like a proof of concept. It's not like the most perfect thing ever. It's not exactly how I want the movie to look, whatever. But we wanted to prove to everybody like we have an idea. We have a script. We have a cast. We have, we have it all put together. We just need the money to make it happen. Um, and so it took us a little bit longer because we did that. So maybe if I had just been like, like everybody else and just been like, Hey, I got a poster and a, you know, a tagline, yeah. give me money. Then maybe I would have been okay. Um, but no, it's, uh, so this is going to be an awesome film. Um, and we will get it made no matter what. Uh, right now, the only variable is really about like travel, um, and gatherings. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are supposed to be doing our principal photography in September. So hopefully by then, Things will be, I, I'm not going to say they're going to be normal. I don't, I, and there is going to be a new normal in this world anyway. But hopefully by that point in time, um, we are able to get together. Um, so it, it involves three siblings who have powers bestowed upon them to where they can um, basically like read you after you die. 
and find out if you were a good person or a bad person and pass judgment on you. And if you are a bad person, they can seal your soul into your rotting corpse. So, um, so there, so every time they read a person, it's going to go back into like a flashback kind of, you know, for lack of a better word from that person's life. And so all of those flashback things, I hired uh, actors who were local or fairly local. And our plan was to do most of those since we didn't need like our entire, like, like our core cast, yeah. we would do those like over weekends, over the summer. Like, you know, there's one that we're shooting. I live on a lake and we're going to shoot it at my lake. And I'm like, Hey, you know, like we're going to get everybody here. Everybody's going to crash my house. We'll have a party. We'll do whatever. And that, those are the ones that, those are the things that I'm kind of like, I don't know if that's going to happen um, before we do principal photography or not, but that'll be our, our biggest variable at this point. Oh, that's interesting. That's real. Yeah. I like that. <clears throat> I like just the story, just the concept of the story. <laughs> and, and it's, it's a cool, it's a cool story. I mean, we kicked out the script pretty fast um, because my sister had had like the, just the basic idea and like we would get, she like, cause I get press passes. Mm -hmm. She started going to conventions with me because you would always get two press passes and yep. I would make her be my camera girl. <laughs> and so I'm like, you, you can come with me and you can get in for free, but you got to do some work here. And we would be on these long trips, like five, six hours, you know, driving somewhere. And we would talk about this story. Um, and we kind of like come up with some different stuff, but like we never put it on paper. And then, so finally, once we decided to put it on paper, it's like we had a lot of it already there. Oh, that's good. <clears throat> that's good. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Rob Mello, um, Alice Winkler from Plank Face, Space Babes from Outer Space. That's what everybody seems to know her from. <laughs> um, Andrea Collins from the hospital, Belly Timber. They are our main siblings. Julianne Prescott, who is like uh, the indie horror princess right now. She is in it. Johnny Shandor, who we talked about before, and Marcella are in it. They play a mother and daughter very aptly. Um, that was the only reason Marcella agreed to do it. She's like, I think I can play my, my kid's mom. Okay, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> but uh, Antoine Steele, who is from a bunch of Todd Sheets movies. And I don't know if you're, if anybody out there who is like a shot on video fan will know who Todd Sheets is. Um, but uh, yeah, he's in it. He was, if you watch Clownado, he was Black Elvis in Clownado. He's, he's coming up from uh, Kansas City. Um, but yeah, and then like I said, a lot of, a lot of local people that we found some really awesome local talent that we're incorporating in and we're just going to do it and have fun. I'm, I'm willing this into existence. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> no, you have, you have to, you have to, because if you put <clears throat> out in the air, then everything goes downhill and it just falls apart, but you keep that positive mindset and it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and well, I am, a, I like to say I'm a stubborn bitch too. <laughs> when I put my mind to something, it happens. Um, so yeah, like one way or another, we'll, we'll get it done. Um, the, like I said, the Indiegogo has not been as successful as I wanted it to be. Um, I found some alternate ways to raise money. Um, I just basically been pimping myself out <laughs> and making some money from some different things. So uh, we're just kind of just pulling in from, some, we're trying to be creative and pulling from some different sources. <clears throat> and honestly, before anything happened, like earlier this year, like probably January or something, I said, I think like, I think we're at the tail end of independent movies being able to be fully funded by crowdfunding. You could tell there was like a lot of fatigue. A lot of people were kind of like, uh, kind of, there were some projects people were getting burned on. Mm -hmm. There were like a lot of projects that like were coming out of the gate with like, you know, like I said, like a poster and an idea and then come to find out they don't even have a script and they're trying to raise money. And so I felt before any of this happened that we were kind of, we were getting on that tail end of, of pure fan contribution. Of course this forced its hand. So I kind of am like, I'm a little like proud that I'm sort of like at the forefront of trying to figure out how to, how to fund a movie in this like new era of mm -hmm. independent horror filmmaking. No, it makes sense though. And I do get what you're saying. Cause I've seen plenty of films, like especially ones I, I not <laughs> the ones I couldn't always 
funds and then you see them a couple months later falling apart. And this is what I was talking about earlier with as far as like people not getting along and bashing each other and you start seeing all that. And I'm like, mm-hmm. keep that behind closed doors, if anything. Don't put that out there because then that's going to yeah. make you, it does a few things. It makes you people not maybe not want to work with you because of this. And then For sure. you're eventually going to stop doing, you know, hey, I'm just going to stop doing movies because. But it's, I understand it happens, but I, I do get what you're saying too, where it's like, you're excited about something. They may even have a teaser trailer. You get real excited. Like, okay, this is going to be awesome. And then all of a sudden, you know what? It fell apart for whatever reason. Yeah. You, a lot of the times that I've seen, honestly, it's been behind the scenes stuff. People. Yeah. It's not even money. A lot of the times, like lately we've seen that. Uh, I, we've seen that already a couple of times in 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's more of personality clashing and people trusting the wrong people or people assuming, uh, you know, things about other people. And it's, it's really, it is sad. It's sad. Mm-hmm. I was involved in one of them. I was actually like, in, like intimately involved in one of those. And it was really sad when it all fell apart. I wonder if I know. What <clears throat> you like, yeah, you I probably do. do. I'll, I'll ask you off. off yeah. the, I'm sure you know. But I think I do. I think. But I can't wait for you guys. I can't wait for, again, this to come out. Just because <laughs> I'll get better at it. I got to practice more, I guess. Hey, but I've got, I mean, you've got the other side is my card that's got like some of my, you know, this was my Indiegogo card from me. Yeah. And then it's got some of my uh, other things that I'm working on. So, I mean, if you just point, you're fine. That's true. You could be talking about any of these things. All your projects. I can't wait to see all your projects. Because, yeah. again, I can tell you're a very passionate horror fan, which that right there makes me want to watch your projects or any of us, when anyone else's project. When you're a true horror fan, you're not just jumping <clears throat> to jump into it. If you're a true horror fan and you just like, hey, I, I want to do a movie, awesome. If I can help fund it, I will. And I feel like uh, the thing I do love about the Indiegogo, being a fan of it, is like it makes you feel you're a part of something. Yeah. As far as like, say, if I fund it to, get, to grab a movie and you get your name in the credits versus yeah. if you go and grab a movie from Walmart. Yes, I'm still going to grab a horror movie from right. Walmart or Amazon or whatever. But I'm not. A, I wasn't a part of that movie. Like I don't feel. I didn't. Oh, I don't feel. I didn't have any hand in doing anything for that movie at all. I just yeah. bought it in the store or ordered it. Out. And something that that people have lost sight of is that when you get something from Indiegogo, it's a perk. It's it's a thank you gift. It's just like those old like PBS telethons, where you gave like a hundred dollars and you got like this generic tote bag, like you weren't paying a hundred dollars for the tote bag. That was your thank you gift. And it's the same thing with Indiegogo. People don't always understand. They're like, well, why do you charge $30 for a t-shirt? No, it's not $30 for a t-shirt. It's we're giving you this t-shirt because as a thank you for you donating the $30, same thing with the Blu-ray DVD. And that's, I think people have lost sight of the idea that Indiegogo is not shopping. Mm-hmm. It is actually support and contribution, and it's more of what you can do for a project as opposed to what the project can do for you. Not, not only that, too, but I look at it like as far as the <clears throat> show or any of the perks you guys give where you can get like something from the scene from the movie, you can get a shirt. There's only X amount of those made, so it's like, okay, say, say you only make 500 of them. Once those 500 are gone, they're gone. And if you're lucky enough gone, to yeah. 500 people to get any of those perks, that's all, to me, that's awesome. Because how it, you can yeah. look at it like if you can go back in the eighties and say help fund Friday the Thirteenth to have your name in the credits, yeah, you would do it. Yeah. What's yeah? Same thing, in my mm-hmm. opinion, same exact thing. And I I'm agree. Doing it as much as I'm gonna keep funding him as much as I can, as long as I can <laughs> afford it. And I just love the genre. I think you guys do an excellent job, and I love when everybody again. You guys have the fresh ideas. You guys have the better stories in a sense. With against Hollywood in times because I feel obviously the budget's way different, so you have to be a lot more creative with things, which I think is a great thing and a healthy thing because then it makes you think more. And again, it's for the fans by the fans. You're just like, wow, they they pulled this off and it looks it was amazing. It was a great story and all this other stuff. And then you when you get to talk to people like, okay, the budget was only this much, and we had to do this, this, and this for these scenes. You're like, oh wow, you guys really pulled that off. That's that's awesome. And a lot of people are self-taught with a lot of like the special, the practical effects and all that stuff, which is another thing I think is amazing because it's like, you don't, you know, you can't, everybody can't afford to go to school and learn all these traits to learn all these things. Mm -hmm. It's expensive as hell. And when you learn Mm -hmm. it on your own and I just appreciate it so much. So thank you. 
cool. Um, you have any questions for me? Um, no. I mean, can I plug, like, I'm feeling we're at the end of this. Can I plug some of my other stuff? Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. Okay. So, um, this next, this coming weekend, I am told, I hope so, uh, a movie that I did, um, actually while we were in quarantine, uh, called Faces of the Dead is going to be out on, um, streaming on video on demand. Um, and uh, the film was mostly done <clears throat> from a director named Will Colazzo. It's an anthology, so all of the segments were pretty much done. And he uh, hit me up to ask if I would want to do, like, the horror host wraparound stuff. Um, and little did he know, I actually already had a character <laughs> called Dr. Bubenstein that I've used before. <laughs> and so, uh, so... When we talk about like the creativity of independent horror, I mean, you know, I sent him some stuff that I had done as Dr. Bubenstein and he was like, great. He just sent me scripts. I filmed things here. You know, he gave me a little bit of direction. I'm like, okay, you know, I like this, this light, this and that. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I used my phone, sent it to him and now it's going to be part of a movie. And it's, you know, like it's, it's cool to be part of something that's like, I don't want to say groundbreaking, but I mean, the fact of the matter is, is like that movie would have just totally been like stuck, yeah. you know, like until other, until somebody could actually like film it. If he hadn't thought of like doing this, you know, and putting, you know, using the horror host as the wraparound and finding mm -hmm. me. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's my most, uh, my next things coming up. And I'm also in a film called Backwoods Bubba. If you have not joined that group on Facebook, you should. It's going to be awesome. I actually ended up being a co-writer on the film. And we've come out with some teasers and some different fun stuff. And we're going to start the Indiegogo on July 1st. And uh, the director, Brad Thomason, has some awesome perks in mind like the one that he the one that i can talk about that he has already said is he's he's gonna have backwoods bubba lunch boxes oh. so yeah there's and there's one really really fun one that i'm really excited about and i can't tell you <laughs> but he is he's being very creative on what he's going to be offering to people and so for real horror fans you are going to dig that movie Especially if you're a slasher fan, you're going to dig the movie and you're really going to dig the Indiegogo perks. Oh, that's, that's very refreshing to hear. That's yeah. very refreshing. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. <clears throat> but thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thank this you for having me. Anytime. I tell this to people all the time. Like, when I say anytime on the show, I mean it. <clears throat> I, I, as, as I start getting things uh, cranked out uh, project wise, I probably am going to hit you up. So. Just Sounds good. Be careful. Be careful what you do when you give people the uh, allowance to do because I will come back. <laughs> I hope so. And it, again, it's just, it's for all of us horror fans to have a good time, have a good chat, help promote things. And especially around these times where we can't do anything else, but stay in Watch home. movies. Yes. Watch, Watch movies. Watch some movies. <laughs> yeah, that too. That too. <laughs> But yeah, seriously though, thank you again for coming on. Had a great time. I would love to do this again. And everybody go check her out everywhere. She's awesome in a lot of indie movies and they're going to be great. <laughs>